<laughs> right, okay. Calculator paper tomorrow. Make sure you're in school nice and early, all right? But we're just going to go through some uh, questions that haven't come up as yet, all right? So first of all, though, uh, clearing your calculator. Make sure you do this when you get into the exam, um, just because... It can use um, a different a different base, or it might uh, change your calculation. So when you are um, clearing your calculator, press Shift because um, what we're going to want is the writing in yellow. So if you press Shift, then you press the number nine, okay? And that's because it says clear above it, and it says set up memory or all. Well, we want to clear it all, so press the number three, and then equals for yes. Then press the AC key, and that just means that everything's been cleared off it. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is just a couple of simplifying um, with index laws. So first one we've got here is m to the power of 5 multiplied by m to the power of 3. Now if you're really not sure, just make sure you write it all out, okay? You should know a rule for this anyway, but if you're ever unsure. So I've got m to the power of 5 and m to the power of 3. And if I multiply all those together and count them up, I get m to the power of 8. All right, and that could have been got by adding the indices together. When it's division, if I were to write out m to the power of 8, wish I'd chosen one with a smaller one, smaller index, and divided it by m to the power of 2, okay, they cancel each other out, and so I'm left with m to the power of 6, okay, and that could have been found by subtracting the indices. Finally, we've got m cubed squared. Now, squared means it's multiplied by itself. So we've got m cubed multiplied by m cubed. And if we use the rule that we did up here, when we're multiplying, we add the indices. So we end up with m to the power of 6. Okay, and those are a few basic index laws. Just remember, um, if it's got a squared, write it out fully. Okay, next up, we have got a frequency tree question. Um. This isn't a probability tree. This is where we're actually putting in um, values. So it tells us that 50 people took a test and um, before the test, they predicted whether they would pass or fail. 30 people predicted they would pass. So this is my prediction column and I'm pressing, putting 30 in there. Now it tells me there's 50 people in total. So if I've got 30 to pass, that must mean that 20 are predicted to fail. Then it says 26 of the people who predicted they would pass did pass. So predicted pass it was 30 and then we've got 26 predicted they would pass did pass. So then I know that this must add up to 30. So if that's 26, this value here is 4. Then it says 37 people passed altogether. So across these two, those people all need to pass. So um, if we've got 37, if I take away this 26, I am left with 11. All right, so 11 people pass there, which means that 9 there fail. And I can just check that. 9 and 11 is 20. 24 takes it up to 50. So I know that that's correct. Okay. Right, next, have a look at this. So Charlie has X pens. Lisa has three more pens than Charlie, and Julian has twice as many pens as Lisa. All right, well, it started with an X, so this is something to do with forming an equation. So I'm going to use forming equations to solve this. Um, so Charlie has X pens, so Charlie has X. Lisa has three more pens than Charlie, so X plus three. And Julian has twice as many as Lisa. So he's got twice as many. Now, if I ever get confused about whether, well, what calculation to do, I think, well, if I had 10 and someone had twice as many as me, 2 multiplied by 10 would be 20. So I've multiplied by 2. So um, Julian's going to have two lots of x plus 3, which I can expand it out, and that becomes 2x plus 6. Now, a question says, how many pens do Charlie, Lisa and Julian have all together? Now, actually, I've said forming equations. It is actually expressions because I'm not having to solve anything. All I'm doing is forming an expression here. So uh, how many do they have all together? If I wanted to work out how many three people had all together, I would add them up. So that's what I'm going to do. 
So x plus x plus 3 plus 2x plus 6. And if I collect my x's together, I've got 1x, add 1x is 2x, add the 2x is 4x, and then 3 plus 6 is 9. Okay, so 4x plus 9 is my final answer. Right, here we've got a question and it says complete the two-way table. Now all the information has been put into the two-way table for me. However, sometimes you might just get a piece of information and you have to create the two-way table yourself as well. This is the most important one to fill in, okay, the total, because that's quite often what people forget. Um, in this case, it's been given, so I'm just going to use addition and subtraction to make sure that these all tally up, okay? So if that's 12 and my total's 30, 30 subtract 12 is 18, okay? So I'm going to have 18 in there. I also know that the total's nine, so for green eyes, four boys, so there must be five girls uh, that have green eyes because the total was nine. Now, I can't work this total out yet because I haven't got enough information, so now I'm going to start looking across my rows to see what I can fill in. So boys, five have blue eyes and four have green eyes, so that's nine altogether, and there's 12 in total, so that must mean that three have brown eyes. For the girls... Five have green, seven have brown, so that's 12 altogether. I've got 18 girls in total, so that must be six. Then I can add up my columns. So I've got 11, three plus seven is 10. And I'm just going to check that these add up. 11 plus 10 is 21, add nine is 30. So I know that that is correct. Next, going to look at writing as a product of prime factors. This is generally answered really well in exams, okay? Um, just remember what the words mean. So product is the answer you get when things are multiplied together. And then we've got our prime numbers, okay? So prime numbers only have um, two factors. They've got to have two factors exactly, okay? So one multiplied by three, and three is a prime number because those are the only two factors it has. So if I start with 280 and I'm going to draw two branches and I need two values that multiply together to give 280. So I'm going to choose 2 and 140. 2 is prime, so I'm going to circle that. That means I leave it alone now. 140, again, I'm going to um, divide that by 2. So I get 2 and 70. And then I'm going to um, draw two lines from that. For 70, I'm going to go for 2 and 35. You don't have to use 2 and 35. You could use um, different numbers. You will always get the same answer. And then for 35, 5 multiplied by 7 gives me 35. They are both prime, so I circle them both. So writing it as a product of its prime factors, so th these are the prime factors. And as a product, I'd write it as 2 multiplied by 2 multiplied by 2 multiplied by 5 multiplied by 7. And that can be written also as 2 cubed multiplied by 5 multiplied by 7. And if this said using index form, you would have to use write it um, with the cubed. Okay. Right. Now I'm going to use prime factorization to find the highest common factor of 24 and 60. So for 24, I'm going to use... Um, that again, so 2 and 12, if I circle the 2, 2 and 6, circle the 2, 2 and 3. And for 60, same again, so 2 and 30, 2 and 15, 3 and 5. And now to find the highest common factor, I'm going to use the Venn diagram. I'm going to label this set as 24 and this as 60. And this intersection is where we've put the factors, the prime factors that belong to 24 and to 60. So there's a two in both, so I'm gonna put that into the intersection. There is another two in both, so that goes in the intersection. And there is a three in both, and that goes in the intersection. And I can always put that two in there, and that five in 60. Now, highest common factor means the highest factor that is common to both numbers. So that means I'm going to use this intersection here to find it. So to find the highest common factor, I'm going to multiply the values in this intersection. So 2 multiplied by 2 
multiplied by 3. 2 multiplied by 2 is 4. Multiplied by 3 is 12. So that is the highest common factor of 24 and 60. Following highest common factor, I'm going to go for um, this question here. Um, and it says, trains leave Bristol um, to Cardiff every 15 minutes and to London every 21 minutes. Um, a train to Cardiff and a train to London both leave Bristol at 11am. At what time will a train to Cardiff and a train to London next leave Bristol at the same time? Okay, so Cardiff trains, um, the first one leaves at 11 the following train will leave at 11.15. The next train will leave at 11.45. And then 12 o'clock, 12.15, 12.30, 12 12.45, 1 o'clock, 1 1.15, 1.30. And I can keep going. The train to London leaves every 21 minutes. So again, the first one leaves at 11 o'clock. The next leaves at 11.21. Next at 11.42. The next at 12.03. The next at 12.24. The next at, I'm writing the wrong number there, 12.45. The next at 1.06. Right, isn't it? The next one is at one twenty-seven. Next at one forty-eight. Um, the next at two o nine. The next at two thirty. Okay, so I'm going to just continue this one on a little bit further. So I've got one forty-five, two o'clock, two fifteen, and two thirty. So here what we have is the next time, oh, sorry, I've missed one out. 12.45 is the one where they leave at the same time, all right? So make sure you do look at all your multiples because otherwise you'll do what I did and keep going for far too long. Okay, so 12.45 p.m. is the next time they'll both leave at the same time. Right, next one. So have you got any tracing paper? Please. Yes, please. Right, so this question here says, describe the single transformation that maps shape A onto shape B. Okay, now there are four types of transformation. Okay, we have a rotation, a reflection, a translation, and an enlargement. Okay, so I need to decide which one of these four it is. Now, an enlargement changes size, okay? So that makes it a similar shape, all right? So, um, but because it changes size, that means that it's this one isn't an enlargement. A rotation would be rotated about a point, so it wouldn't have the same orientation, okay? So it's not a rotation. A reflection would be reflected or flipped over, so it's not a reflection. And so that leaves me to translation, okay? It's in the same orientation, it's just been slid across the page. So for one mark, I need to write that it is a translation, okay? That is really key. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose two corresponding points on A and B. So I've gone for the top right-hand corner on both. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a vector. I'm going to write a vector for this, and that shows how it's moved across my page. So to go from A to B, I always go side to side first, okay? So I've gone one, two, three, four, and I've gone four to the right. And as I go to the right on the graph, they're positive numbers. So that's a positive four to show I've gone to the right. If I went to the left, that would be negative four. I then go down, one, two, three. And now because I'm going down, that's going into my negatives, so that's negative three. If I was moving upwards, that's positive. So if you think about the graph, that will help you decide whether it's positive or negative. 
So a to b is 4 minus 3. If it said what was the translation from b to a, again choosing two corresponding points, 1, 2, 3, 4. Now I'm going to the left, so that will be negative 4, and up 3, so that's positive 3. Okay, and you can see how it relates. We're just going in the opposite directions. Right, next up, and I will just leave those there because we've got the types of transformations. So for this question here now, describe fully the single transformation that maps A onto B. And I'm looking at all of these. Once again, it's not an enlargement because um, it's the same size, so it's a congruent shape. This time it's not a translation because it's a different orientation. It's not been reflected or flipped over, so it must be a rotation. Okay, so there's a few things that we need to write to get the full marks when we say that something is a rotation. We need to say that it is a rotation. We also need to say in which direction the number of degrees, and finally, the centre of rotation. Okay, so I'm just going to, to decide the direction and the number of degrees, trace over this, and just see when it gets into the same orientation. So if I went like that, that's not in the same orientation, and that's 90 degrees, oh, sorry, like that, that's 90 degrees, okay? So just go again. Sorry, moving that. That would give me a 90 degree turn. Okay, so it's a rotation. I've gone clockwise. I've gone 90 degrees. And then I need to know my center of rotation. Okay, so here, if I tried, say, 0, 0. Okay, so I'm just trying the coordinates. If I put my pen on 0, 0 and rotated it, that would not end up that would not end up on the shape. Oh yeah, sorry. I think that did end up on the shape. I'm just moving this as I turn around. A bit on top, right, that's why. So if I do this, And I can just double check it because if I go across two and across one, along two and across one, it takes me to the same point. Okay, just be really accurate with that. Try not to use a felt tip pen because then you can get actually on the points. Okay, next one, expand and simplify. So a little bit of algebra here. Now here we've got double brackets so this is going to produce um, a quadratic. And that means that I should get four terms out of it. Okay, so I'm going to do y multiplied by y first of all, which is y squared. Then y multiplied by negative 4, which is negative 4y. 5 multiplied by y, which is 5y. And 5 multiplied by negative 4, which is negative 20. And then I collect my like terms. Now, y squared is not um, like to y, so I leave y squared on its own. Negative 4 add 5 is 1y, or just y. And then we've got minus 20 at the end. So y squared plus y minus 20. Next question, it's asking me to factorise, okay? So to factorise this, I'm going to look at uh, this expression. Um, and... Because it says fully, that gives me a hint that there might be one, more than one thing that I'm going to put on the outside of my brackets. So first, if I look at 9 and 6, the highest common factor of 9 and 6 is 3. So 3 can go on the outside of my bracket. Now I've got a squared and a. So again, an a can go on the outside of my bracket because it's common to both terms. I open my bracket. Now 3 multiplied by what gives me 9? That would be 3. And a multiplied by what gives a squared? That would be a. Then minus 
3 multiplied by what gives me negative 6a? That would be minus 2. Finally, at the bottom of it here, it says solve x squared minus 12x plus 20 equals 0. Okay, now to solve this, I'm going to have to factorise. So when I look at this, because there's no common term, um, com uh, no common factor other than 1, I'm going to use double brackets. I'm going to begin both with an x to get the x squared. And then what I need are two numbers that multiply to give me 20, which is positive, but which add together to give me negative 12. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to list my factors of 20 first of all. So I've got 1 and 20, 2 and 10, 4 and 5. However, they add together to give me negative 12. So what I need here, I need to think about what my signs are going to be. I know a positive and a positive would multiply to give me a positive answer, but also a negative and a negative would multiply to give me positive. So both my signs are going to be negative. And then I need a pair which sum to give me negative 12. So I'm going to make all of these negative. Okay, minus 4 plus minus 5 would be minus 9. They would give me negative 12. So minus 2 and minus 10. Now to solve this, we are saying something multiplied by something has to give us 0. Which means either this bracket here equals 0 or this bracket here has to equal 0. So in this case, x minus 2 is 0, x must equal 2. Or in this case, x must equal 10. So I've got my two solutions. And if I substituted either of these in, it would give me the answer 0. Right. Quick look at um, a linear sequence now. So it says here are the first four terms of an arithmetic sequence. Write an expression in terms of n for the nth term of this sequence. So this is saying come up with a rule, okay, so that you could generate any term in the sequence. So I look at it and it's increasing by 4 each time. Because it's increasing by 4 each time, I know it's something to do with the 4 multiplication table. So that tells me it's um, 4n. 4 multiplied by something and then I need to see how I get to the sequence. So 4 multiplied by 1 is 4. 4 multiplied by 2 is 8, 4 multiplied by 3 is 12, 4 multiplied by 4 is 16. So I've listed the 4 multiplication table and then I look and I think how do I get from um, the multiplication table to the sequence and each time I add 2. So my final nth term is 4n plus 2. The next part says the nth term of a different sequence is 3n plus 5. Is 108 a term of this sequence? Show how you get your answer. Now, you could list all of these um, values, or what we can do is we can set up an equation. So we're going to use an equation, and we're going to solve it to find out whether it is a term. So 3n plus 5 equals 108. Now, if this is a term in the sequence, n will be a whole number, and it will be telling you which term it is, so which, how far along it is. So to solve this, I'm going to subtract 5 from both sides, so I get 3n equals 103 and then to get n on its own I'm going to divide both sides by 3 all right um, and that would be 34 and then I'm going to have a remainder so 34.3 recurring so that means because it's not it's not a whole number that it isn't a term in the sequence and it's actually between the 34th and 35th term Right, next one here is six shapes. Which shape is congruent to shape E? Okay, so this is exactly the same shape and size. It can be a different orientation, um, but they have to be exactly the same shape and size. So E is this one here, okay? And if I look at that, one, two, three, four. So I know it's got a, for one, I know it's got to cover just four squares. And if I look, that would be A. Then it states name two other congruent shapes, so two other shapes which are exactly the same as each other, and that would be D and C. 
they are exactly the same. D and C. Right. So get on to a couple of questions that we might want to use a calculator for. So the table shows some information about the foot lengths of 40 adults, okay? So this is basically saying three adults have got a foot length of between 16 centimetres and 18 centimetres, six between 18 and 20 and so on. Now it says write down the mode or class interval. So that means the most common um, size of foot. So if I look at the number of adults, 12 people is the most and 12 people have a foot length of 22 to 24 centimetres. Okay, so that is my modal class interval. The next part says calculate an estimate for the mean foot length. Okay, now this says calculate an estimate because we don't know exactly how long each person's foot is because it's um, saying between 16 and 18. So it could be 16.2 centimetres, they could be 17.5. We're not sure exactly. Okay, so the, we just use what we think is most fair. And in this case, we're going to use the midpoint. Okay, so I'm going to draw two extra columns onto this table. Obviously, normally I'd use a ruler. And I'm going to do a totals row as well. Now, we don't need to know what the total midpoint is, okay? Because I'm just using that as a point of reference. So the midpoint is 16 and 18 and 17. Here is 19, 21. 23 and 25 okay so it so three people have approximately a foot length of 17 centimeters so here this is my frequency this is my midpoint so this is where I'm multiplying these two together okay so first of all three multiplied by 17 is 51 because I'm saying three you've got a length of 17 six multiplied by 19 is 114, 10 multiplied by 21 is 210, 12 multiplied by 23 is 276, and 9 multiplied by 25 is 225. Okay, so what I've worked out so far is actually, um, it's, it, it, this is just used instead of writing out 17 plus 17 plus 17. So now to find the mean, you, it's the sum divided by the number of values, okay? So in this case, the number of values is 40 because there were 40 adults that took part. And now what I want to do is find out what all their total foot lengths would add up to. So 51, add 114, add 210, add 276, add 225 is 876. So the total foot lengths is 876 centimetres. There were 40 people, so when I do that, I get 21.9 centimetres. So the mean length was 21.9 centimetres. Um, just a note, quite often people will think to divide by five, okay, because there's five groups. Now, if I'd have done 876 divided by five, I'd have had quite a large number. It would have been over, you know, 170, 180. So straight away, I know that that couldn't be right. This makes sense because it's within this um, data. Okay. Right. So here we've got more of a multi-step problem. Okay, so it says triangles ABD and BCD are right-angled triangles. Okay, straight away when I see right-angled triangles, I'm thinking, right, is it anything to do with Pythagoras? Is it anything to do with trigonometry? So, it asks me to work out the value of x. Now, x is a side length here. Um, now, when I look at this triangle, I need to find this length. I know this length, but I haven't got any information here. And other than right angle, I'm not given any, um, any number of degrees. So, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to actually look at this triangle, okay? Because I need to know what length that side is. So here I've got two lengths and I need to find another missing side. So that means I need to use Pythagoras. Now Pythagoras' theorem is a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And c is the hypotenuse 
or the longest side. It doesn't matter which way around you do A and B. So my hypotenuse is always opposite the right angle. Okay, so if I just redraw this triangle, we've got 5, 10, and we're trying to find this side. So I'm going to label that with C because it's my hypotenuse. This can be A, this can be B. So A squared plus B squared equals C squared. But I'm trying to find the longest length, so I'm trying to, f um, sorry, I'm trying to find a shorter length. Okay, so actually I need to find B, so I need to get that on its own. So to work out that, I'm actually going to square the other two sides, but instead I'll subtract them from each other. So I've got 10 squared and I've got 5 squared, but I'm going to subtract them from each other. So B squared is 100 minus 25, so B squared equals 75. Now to work out the length of B, I would square root both sides and the square root of 75 is 8.66. So I know this length is 8.66. Now, I've got this length and I've got this length and I need to find the third length. So again, that means that I can use Pythagoras, okay, because I've got two lengths and I'm finding a missing length. Now, looking at this triangle, trying to find this side here. And when I'm looking at that, that's opposite the right angle. So actually, that's the hypotenuse. Okay, so I've got A and B there. And so I need to square these two shorter sides. And because I'm finding the longest, I need to add them together. So I need to do 8.66 squared plus 4 squared to work out what c squared is. Now I know that that is 75. 4 squared is 16, and that will give me c squared. 75 plus 16 is 91, so 91 is c squared. So to work out what c is, I'm going to square root 91. I need to remember square root. And that gives me 9.53939. Now it says give your answer correct to two decimal places. So one, two, so I look at that three and I think, is that going to stay as a three or is it going to round to a four? Because it's a nine afterwards, that means I'm going to round my final answer to 9.54 centimetres. Okay, and that's the final answer. Right. Next up. So the diagram shows a right angled triangle and it says calculate X. So once again, right angle triangle, it's either going to be Pythagoras, which I'm just going to write as Pythag because I'm getting lazy now, or trig. So looking at this, I need to find a length. I've been given another length, but this time I've also been given an angle. Now, if I want to use Pythagoras, I need two of the lengths to find the third. So in this case, actually, because I've got this angle, it's going to be trigonometry. So I need to use trigonometry here. And I'm just going to write out so ka toa just here. All right, and those are the trig functions we've got there. So um, I, what we always do at this stage is we label our sides. Now I'm only going to label two out of the three sides because I don't need anything with this. I haven't been given this length and I'm not trying to find it. So this is opposite the angle, so I'm going to label that with O. And this side is next to the angle, so I'm going to label that with an A. So I've got O and A, so that tells me that it's TOA, or I'm going to use TAN. So I've got TAN 35 equals opposite over adjacent, which is 4. Okay. If you prefer using the triangle, again, TAN 35, opposite is what we're trying to find, and adjacent is 4. Okay, T-O-A. So to work out what X is, we're going to multiply these together. Now on my calculator, I'm going to type in tan 35. Just remember to close that bracket and then multiply by 4. And that gives me an answer of 2.800. Okay, doesn't tell me what to round it to, so I'm going to just round it to 2.8 centimetres. And don't forget, because it's a length, we write centimetres. Next one. Oh, look at that, another right angle triangle. So, 
PQR is a right angled triangle. Again, it's either going to be Pythagoras or it's going to be trigonometry. Okay, now I've got two lengths, but I need to find a missing angle. If I'm going to try and find a missing angle, Pythagoras isn't going to help me here. So I'm going to use trigonometry. Okay, once again, I'm going to label my um, sides. So this is the angle that I'm trying to find. So I label this with opposite. And I label this with hypotenuse. And I'm not labeling this side because I don't need anything to do with it. Again, we've got Sokotoa. Um, I've got O and H, so that means I'm going to be using sine this time. Now, if you use the triangle, that's absolutely fine. So sine X, O is 5, and H is 14. Or sine X equals 5 over 14. All right, so this time I need to work out what X is, which means I need to get X on its own, or I need to isolate X. So the way that I do that is by doing the inverse of sine. And the way that we do that is by using sine to the minus 1 of 5 over 14. And what that means is that when I'm trying to find an angle, I have to press shift and then the trig ratio. And then 5 divided by 14. Which is 20.9248 which I'm going to round to 20.9 degrees because it says one decimal place. What if you only have one side? If you are only given one side and what are you trying to find a, an angle or a, another side? For look, if I go back to this, if you're only given one side, it might be a case, if you're given one side, that it might be one of these questions um, where you're going to have to work out this length here before you can move on to that one. Can you think of anything else where you'd only be given one side? Uh, the only other thing is if it was, for example, um, you might be given something like this. Okay, so there's the centre. And it might say find that length there. All right. Now, because this is a circle, this is the radius because it's from the centre to the outside. But also that's the radius. All right. So you might have to just use the same number. All right, so if, for example, it said the radius is six centimetres, I can't even spell now, six centimetres, that means that side six and that side six. So then you do six squared plus six squared equals C squared. Okay, 36 add 36 is 72 is C squared. And then you'd square root both sides to work out what C is. So that's the case of if it's an isosceles triangle as well. So if you got something like that and it said um, that's... A, B, C. Length A, B is 8. All right, you'd also know that that side was 8 as well. Although that's not actually, well, that could be a right angle triangle like that. Right. Right, see, so this question here, it says it's a probability tree diagram. So this is a bit different to the one that we saw before where it had circles. That was a frequency tree. When it's a probability tree diagram, remember that probability sums to one. Okay, so you're not going to have whole numbers along here unless it was certain. All right, so here, um, you might be asked to draw one of these or fill in missing numbers. Always, these branches must always add up to one. So like here, these two branches, 0 0.3 plus 0 0.7, they always add up to one. Okay. Now it says work out the probability of winning both games. So that means winning game A and winning game B. So when we do one thing and another, that means we multiply. So when we say the probability of A and the probability of B, what we do is we multiply. Okay, so in this case, the probability of winning game A is 0 0.2. Probability of winning game B is 0 0.3. So I'm going to multiply those together. Do not think about writing 0 0.6. Okay, 2 multiplied by 3, which would be 6. Okay, but this has been, that's 10 times smaller, that 10 times smaller. So it'd be 100 times smaller, which is 0 0.06. But you do have a calculator, so use it. Right, why do you keep laughing, you two? Making me feel, feel nervous. <laughs> right. 
So exams like to ask you about really relevant questions, but actually, whilst this might seem a little bit of a pain, you do end up when you go shopping, actually looking at things like this. So soap powder is, in, uh, is sold in three sizes of box. So we've got two kilograms for £1.89, five kilograms for £4.30 and nine kilograms for £8.46. And it, which, it wants to know which uh, box of soap powder is the best value for money. So that means which one costs the least. So it's not a case of, oh, you get more with that, so you'd have to go shopping less times. It's actually, we need to know with evidence which one um, costs the least. Um, so I've got two kilograms here that cost £1.89. Um, one nice thing with this question is that they're all in the same unit. If this was kilograms and that was grams, then you'd want to convert them to the same unit. And the same as if that was pounds and that was pence, same thing. So to work out the cost of one unit, I always think, if ever I'm not sure what I want to divide by, if three pens cost 30p, how would I find the cost of one pen? Okay, well, I, I divide that by three as well, because I divide both by three. I divide it by the quantity. Okay, so here we've got two kilograms is £1.89. I want to know the cost of one kilogram. So I'm going to divide that. Because I divide that by two, I divide the cost by two. So I'm always doing the cost divided by the number of units. Okay, and £1.89 divided by two is um, 94.5 pence or 0 0.945. Okay, I'm going to do the same here. And again, if you feel more confident using a double number line, okay, so we've got kilograms and we've got the cost. So five kilograms costs £4.30. I want to know the cost of one. So because I divide that by five, I'm going to divide this side by five. So £4.30 divided by five is 86p or 0 0.86 and then this one here nine kilograms costs eight pound 46 so one kilogram i divide by nine so i do eight pound 46 divided by nine and that gives 0 0.94 okay so the cheapest one, which size of box is the best value for money? The cheapest one clearly is this one. So it's the five kilograms is best value. Because that is 86 pence per kilogram best value. Okay, make sure that you put this sentence on at the end. Right, bearings, lovely bearings. Okay. So we're given this question here and it says work out the bearing of B from A. So it's given us A, uh, it's given us the north line. Now with bearings, a couple of things, you always measure clockwise or uh, calculate clockwise um, and it's always got to have three figures and it's from the north line and also it says B from A, okay? So from A to B is like that, okay? Now this is quite a nice question here because I know that angles on a straight line sum to 180. I've also been given that that part of it is 50. So if I add together 180 and 50, I get 230 degrees. Okay, so the bearing of B from A is 230. It might also ask the bearing of A from B. Okay, and in which case, if I drew a north line at B, and I need to work out A from B, so I'm going to A from B. Now, in this case here, all right, if I know what this angle is, I know that that's 230, I know that this bit of the angle 360 take away 230 is 130. Okay, so I know that that angle there is 130 degrees. I also know that co-interior angles sum to 180. So I know that that there is 50 degrees. I could have also used that using alternate angles. Now, if I was writing that, I'd have to write it as 0, 050 0 degrees because it's a bearing and needs three figures. We've had a request for a three-way probability trade diagram at some point. Right. Do you have one coming up? I can do one right now. Um, is it foundation? It is the foundation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
foundation yet. So it's going to need to be de uh, independent events, yeah. isn't it? Three, and we've also had the simultaneous equations. Yeah, we've we'll got some of Yeah, yeah. All right, so um, three-way probability tree. So if, say, um, I've got a bag of marbles, sorry for the really lame example, all right, and I've got three red in there, five yellow, and six blue, okay? And it says, what is the probability of picking two the same colour? Right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to represent this on a tree diagram. All right, now these are a pain to draw. So it's going to have three branches because I've got red, I've got yellow, and I've got blue. So that's my pick. So that's pick one. Then I'm going to pick again. So I've got red, yellow, and blue for each one, okay? Because the probability tree is just a way of listing all the different outcomes. Now, this question for foundation, it's gonna be replaced, all right? So, I've got three red, five yellow, and six blue. So in total, three add five is eight, add six is 14. All right, so I'm gonna make these out of 14. I'm also gonna make these out of 14. If it wasn't replaced, this would actually decrease to 13. Right, so I've got three red, five yellow, and six blue. And because it's been put back in, the probabilities all stay the same. Can you throw me a highlighter? Have you got a highlighter? Right, so the question says probability like of picking two the same colour, all right? So that means I could pick a red and a red, or I could pick a yellow and a yellow, or I could pick a blue and a blue. Oops, data calls. Right, so a red and a red would be 3 over 40. So it'd be three over, so red and red would be three over 14 multiplied by three over 14, which would be nine over 196. Um, a yellow and a yellow would be five over 14 multiplied by five over 14, which would be 25 over 196. And then a blue and a blue would be six over 14 multiplied by 6 over 14, which would be 36 over 196, okay? So I could get a red and a red, or a yellow and a yellow, or a blue and a blue. So what I need to do now is add these three probabilities together, okay? So 9 add 25 is 36, add another 36 is 72 over 196, and then you can simplify that as well. Right. Um. Here we've got a question. So a straight line is shown on the grid and it says work out the, the equation of line L. Okay, so equations uh, for straight lines are in the form y equals mx plus c. m is the gradient and c is the y-intercept or where it crosses the y-axis. Okay, so looking at this straight away, I can see it crosses the y-axis at minus 1. So I know that it's y equals mx plus c minus 1. Okay, so that plus c, it can be a negative as well. It just depends where it crosses over the axis. Okay, now I need to find the gradient. Now with this question, you have to be particularly careful, okay, because actually, um, I was going to say the scales are different. They're not, they're not different at all. So just ignore me. So to find the gradient, I choose two points on the line where it intersects uh, through the corners of the grid and what I'm going to do is I'm going to do rise and the tread. So the rise is one and the tread is one. So the gradient is one divided by one which is just one. So y equals 1x minus one or I could just write that as y equals x minus one. 
Um, okay. Right, here it's told me rectangles A, B, C, D and E, F, G, H are similar. Okay, and it says work out the length of F, G. So I need to work out this length. Now, the first thing that I need to know, all right, is the scale factor. Because what's happened, if they're similar, then whatever that's been enlarged by, so if that's been doubled, then the length has to be doubled. It has to be in proportion. Okay, so I need to know the scale factor. Now, I've, been, I've got corris two corresponding sides. Okay, I've got five and eight. So to work out the scale factor, I'm going to do eight divided by five. Okay, and if I do eight divided by five, it gives me 1.6. So my scale factor is 1.6. If it was recurring, you'd use exactly that number. Make sure that you just keep your answer on the screen. Okay, just keep it on there and calculate with that. So the scale factor is 1.6. So to find FG, what I'm gonna to need to do is take nine and multiply it by 1.6. And this works really well with double number lines as well. And when I do that, it gives me 14.4 centimeters. Just a reminder, if it gives you two shapes um, where it's like that, make sure you draw them out separately, okay? So that's one triangle and it's sat on top of a bigger triangle. Make sure you draw them out separately. Right, here we go. Paul invests £500 at a rate of 1.5% per year compound interest. Find the value after three years and give your answer to the nearest penny, okay? So, for compound interest, um, if you've got a calculator, a quick way of doing it is the investment multiplied by the multiplier to the power of and the number of years. Okay, so the number of years it will be in there. So, Paul invests 500, okay? And it's at a, a, rate, a, a rate of 1.5%. Okay, now what I'm going to do here is it starts off at 100% and it's going to be increasing by 1.5%. Okay, so that means it's getting added on. So in total, we'll have 101.5% of the original amount. Now I want to turn this into a multiplier. So what I have to do is divide this by 100, which gives me 1.015. So that's my multiplier that I'm going to use. So 500 multiplied by 1.015 and then to the power of three years, okay? So I'm literally going to type this into my calculator. So 500 multiplied by 1.015 cubed and equals, and so after three years, oh, he's going to have 522 pounds and um, it's 839, okay, it's to the nearest penny. When we're dealing with money, we've got two digits after the decimal point, okay? So that will be 84. So 522 pounds, 84 pence. Then it says, by what percentage um, has the value of Paul's investment increased after three years? So this is a percentage change. We want to calculate a percentage change. So... To do this, we work out the change and we have to compare it to what it was originally. And then we multiply that by 100 to turn it into an, uh, a percentage. Okay, so it started off as 500. So to work out the difference, I'm going to take those away. So £22.84 is what it's changed by. So £22.84 divide it by the original amount, which was 500. That would give me a, a, a decimal. So 22 pounds 84 divided by 500. And if I multiply that by 100, that converts it to 4.568%. Okay, so that's what it's increased by. Cool, cool, cool. I'm right, just thinking, what, sh what should I do, what should I do? Uh, right, okay. Right, lovely question. Sorry, I'm very, very sleepy here. A water tank is a cylinder with radius 40 centimetres and depth 150 centimetres. Right, what you need to be able to do for tomorrow is you need to be able to calculate volume, okay? And you need to be able to do it for various shapes. All right, so volume 
make sure you can remember that it is the area of the cross section. If it's a prism, if it's a prism, if it's something different, it will give you the formula. Area of cross section, okay, and you multiply it by the depth. All right. So, for example, if it's a cuboid, you find the area, okay, which base multiplied by height, and then you multiply it by the depth. Remember, for triangular prisms, the formula for the area of a triangle is base multiplied by the perpendicular height, but then you need to divide it by two, okay, and then you multiply it by the depth. Okay, here for a cylinder, again, it's the area of the circle, okay, which is pi r squared. And then we'd multiply it by the depth, or in this case, we might call it the height. Right, okay, so a water tank is a cylinder with radius 40 and depth 150 centimetres. Okay, so if I look at this question, straight away I'm thinking, right, I'm just going to find the volume first of all. All right, so it's told me that the radius is 40 centimetres, so I'm going to do pi multiplied by r squared, or pi multiplied by 40 squared. So 40 squared is uh, 1600, multiply that by pi, and that gives me 5026.54 and so on. And that's centimetres squared, because that is so far the area of the circle. Then what I need to do is I need to multiply it by the depth okay so then what I'm going to do here is I'm going to multiply it by 150 and that gives me 753982.2369 centimeters cubed now it says to me it is filled at the rate of 0.2 liters per second and one liter is 1000 centimeters cubed Okay, does it take longer than one hour to fill the tank? Okay, well, we're dealing this um, in seconds. So there's two ways we can go about it. We can think about how long one hour is. So one hour is 60 minutes of 60 seconds. Okay, which is 3,600 seconds. Now 0.2 litres is 200 millilitres. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to see how many 200 millilitres will fit into this. So if I divide this by 200, and I've kept the answer in my screen, so divide that by 200, and it gives me um, 3,769.9. Okay, so that's how many seconds it takes to fill the cylinder, 3,769. Um, we've worked out that one hour is 3,600 seconds, so it does take, because that's greater than 3,600, yes, it does take longer. Is that time? Mm -hmm. Right, will you do a simultaneous equations one? On the home, yeah. 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 Cool. Right, they are going to do simultaneous equations. Will you also do a parallel lines one as well? Yeah, yeah. and a parallel lines one. They'll do what they're told, basically. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, make sure you get some sleep tonight. I don't care about Love Island. It's your maths GCSE tomorrow and that's important. You can record it and treat yourself tomorrow night. Um, but well done. Well done to those people who came today and we'll see you early in the morning.